And, and we are live. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen, and welcome to our uh, Google Plus Microbiology Journal Club. And we are we are a group of scientists that we just get. We're a group of microbiologists that are just really interested in various different topics in microbiology. And so we get together and we read um, interesting papers that come out in Cell or just have a lot of impact or just papers that we're interested in when we have time. And so I have here with me today, I have Laura and Mark, and uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. So Laura, why don't you start first? You have to introduce yourself, Karen. You didn't actually introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, my name is Karen. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Simon Fraser University, and I study a bacteria called Brancella tularensis, and I look at uh, the the different virulence factors that this bacteria has, the proteins that cause disease, and I characterize um, and I well I identify them and I characterize them. And so I'll now now Laura, it's your turn. <laughs> uh, my name is Laura Williams and I'm a new assistant professor at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, at the moment I'm just trying to keep my head above water being in, in my first semester. But um, one of the things that I'm interested in studying is bacterial lifestyle and the evolution of different bacterial lifestyles. I'm specifically getting into predatory bacteria uh, with the help of, of some colleagues like Mark, who's been a very valuable uh, source of information. And with that, I will just hand it over to Mark. Hello, I'm Mark Martin, uh, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound, and I am the entropically challenged member of this group. I would also go on to say I feel, having just watched Dana Carvey, that I should call myself Garth. With me at all, you know, we should do the whole Wayne's World thing. It should be maybe Karen's World today. What do you think? <laughs> Most excellent? Yes, uh, I picked this, well, I chose this paper because, or suggested that we do this because I really, really love cheese. I am such a big fan of cheese. Um, for a while, uh, when all of my friends asked me, oh, what do you want to do after you finish your degree? Uh, for a while, I said, I just want to use microbiology and make really, really good tasting cheese. And so <laughs> that, that made a lot, that got a lot of laughs. And um, when I went to a networking meeting one year, uh, there was a food scientist who worked at the Wine Research Center at UBC. Um, I invited him. He unfortunately didn't make it, I guess. But uh, he suggested that I look at the research of the Dutton Lab at Harvard. And um, so that's how this, it led me to this wonderful paper that we're reading today. And so this paper is called uh, Cheese Rind Communities Provide Tractable Systems for In Situ and In Vitro Studies of Microbial Diversity. And again, it's by the Dutton Group at Harvard. And uh, they, They've been looking at uh, use. They've been looking at community microbial communities using cheese as a model. And so, um, how about Laura? Would you like to summarize the paper for us? Sure. Um, oh, I was really glad that you picked this paper because um, microbial ecology is something that's not part of my training background, but it's something that is incredibly important for understanding some of the things that I'm interested in. Bacterial lifestyle, for instance, if I'm going to be looking at predatory bacteria, that is an ecological interaction between predators and prey. And so I've been thinking a lot about microbial ecology and thinking a lot about microbial communities. And this is a neat paper to read because they really wanted to try to understand some, some what are fundamental questions, but questions that are still uh, open questions, things about what shapes microbial diversity in particular communities? What are the biotic and abiotic factors that can lead to certain types of communities forming? How reproducible is community formation? And then one of the things that I liked the most is that, um, you know, it's not just bacteria in here. There's fungi that are studied as well. So poor fungi and viruses usually get left out a lot of these studies because bacteria are just <coughs> easier to go after. Um, and in this case, they were looking at interactions between bacteria and fungi. So they, they got a lot in here that I think is a really intriguing um, foundation for asking what are some very important questions about just microbial community structure in general. I mean, historically, uh, the study of, of ecology, well, most of us in biology look for model systems. 
And if you read Carl Zimmer's excellent Smithsonian article called The Human Lake, about how the kind of the background of, of ecology, of me mega-organismal biology, actually informs microbial ecology, and it's very useful and very accessible. I have many friends who are interested in the idea of coming up with a, a model system for microbial ecology. Ashley Shade, for example, thinks about kefir communities, which fascinate me. Uh, but this is remarkable because I had thought things would be so completely complex, it would be very difficult to dissect out members. My wife, being a combinatorial uh, mathematician, I start to think about combining different numbers. Think about it when we study biofilms. Biofilms never occur really monospecifically in nature. There's a whole community going on. And I've known people that publish, like, well, I looked at two different types of species together. And I, I'm not quite raising my eyebrow, but that's kind of where I'm at. But here's the case where we're looking at how many different things, Laura? 140 some odd? And then you're looking at the various combinations between them. And so I think it's a wonderful paper for that reason. I agree. All right. So um, I'll come back to what you just mentioned about kefir communities later, Mark, when we can talk about the way that people are using fermented foods as different models for microbial communities. But uh, so let's just jump right into the paper. But um, so they go over. Um, I'm just going to come out and say right now that I'm actually really nervous because what happens when I facilitate is I have to stare at my face in the webcam and it's really strange. It's very yeah, strange to see myself staring back at myself. That's so, so true. When I've done it, I don't, don't feel badly. When I've done it, I found out I blink a whole heck of a lot when that green light is on and I had no idea. And so when I edit things that I've done, I have to think about it. So Karen, you're doing fabulously. Trust me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, in this, yeah, okay, so I can just breathe and um, know that I'm among friends. Okay. That's right. <laughs> and we're talking about cheese. Yes, we are talking about cheese. What's your and favorite so, cheese? What's my favorite cheese? That's yeah. really hard to say. Um, I like cheese that are that have lots of moisture, so I'm a soft cheese person. Oh, I think and it's that's a key thing that they talk about in here yes. in terms of, I thought that was so neat. And so, um, I, yeah, so I was really, so I guess we could just talk, we can start with that, which is the influence of abiotic factors um, on the community and the diff so in the paper they talk about how there are different types of cheese rinds that influence the uh, microbial species with, that grow within the rind. So they talk about three different types of rinds, and these three rinds are um, bloom, uh, natural rinds, which are not, which are just covered in a regular cloth and allowed to develop. Um, they have salt washed rinds, which uh, are repeatedly washed in salt water over um, the period of time the cheese is allowed to mature. And the last is a bloomy rind, which um, is like a brie or something that you would see with a white, a thick white on the surface. And I didn't actually know that these things were edible. Like when I ate them, I would always just peel them off. <laughs> what about the two of you? I didn't realize that cheese rinds were best described as biofilms. I didn't, I, you know, I guess I just never really thought about it. Um, I haven't looked that much into cheese making apart from knowing that cheeses are yummy. Um, and I thought the, the bloomy cheese rinds that you mentioned, I thought that was interesting because they made a point about how it's heavily inoculated with fungi. So even though these communities in the rinds are a mix of bacteria and fungi, specifically with the bloomy rinds, they have an opportunity to look at what happens when you manipulate it, so you're artificially introducing a lot of fungi. So it's neat that they've just, through the process of cheese making, which has all kinds of historical and cultural significance, but they've got these three different types that they could find at all these different geographic locations that give them these cool variables to test. That's really neat. And so uh, these, I guess these variables that you were talking about, the three that they did mention that influenced the, um, that influenced the development of the cheese were the percentage of moisture, uh, the pH, and the salt concentration. And it's just like you were saying, Laura, even though they collected all of these different um, rinds from across the world, they were able to find 
similar species that existed within the Rhines. And I found, I found that really interesting. I guess that we, that's something that we can talk about for a little bit, which is why is it that we can find such common species um, in fungal and bacterial across these rinds, even though um, they are from different parts of the world? Um, what, do you, what do you think about that, Mark? Well, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm not quite with Boss Becking with the idea that everything is everywhere and the environment selects, but it is certainly true that microbes disperse extremely well over very, very long distances. I have a friend, uh, he's retired now, who told me he used to teach a microbial ecology course where he would have the students isolate dozens of different types of microbes from a gram of soil. So it wouldn't surprise me most everything is there. Um, I kind of think about it if you look at, at um, Africa versus Central America. You have leopards in one place and jaguars in the other. So perhaps it's a matter of, of what is been Darwinoed into a particular environment. And, and so working with how plastic microbial genomes and phenotypes are, if there's an environment in which they do well, will tend to kind of attract the same sorts of members to it to take advantage of that niche. So I, I admit, I mean, I come at this with the idea that we're in this vast cloud of microbes and I, I'm concerned about the ones that are passing by versus the ones that have taken up residence. But I would argue by now, as far as cheese making goes, almost certainly we have microbes that are specifically adapted to that environment. And it will be interesting to see what happens, and I'm sure they're working on this, introducing various kinds of um, contaminants into it to see what happens. They might be excluded, for example, because of the lactic acid organisms that make bacteriosins, for example. This might be very interesting stuff. Yeah, and I thought it was, they were, <clears throat> as far as I, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as I could tell, they were pretty careful about the granularity of what they identified. So this kind of builds a bit on a couple of other journal clubs that we've had, which are, are you can see them on the YouTube site, um, that were about, like, uh, meta, I gotta get the plug in, right? Um, to monetize this, Laura. <laughs> I'm gonna Support retire your early. <laughs> Um, but they are, it's sequence based, but they were pretty careful in what they classified that most of, as, as far as I could tell, most of the data that they showed, they stopped classification at the genus level, at yeah. least from what I could tell. So they identified dominant genera, and then I was kind of curious, and I think they recognized, as we've discussed before, that there's some limitations when you're doing um, sequencing analysis on where you bin your reads in terms of, of how fine of a, a scale you can really get. But I think it's interesting because it kind of made me wonder, there was, there was one cluster um, in their figure two that was, you know, dominated by Staphylococcus. And so then I kind of thought, oh, well, what kind of Staphylococcus is it? And what does it do? And what is it, you know, is it, is it all the same Staphylococcus? Is it all, you know? So that's... That was really interesting, and I couldn't tell from that. I didn't have a chance to look to see if those clusters were geographically distributed. Um, but it's really interesting that it's that it's. We know that these genera are showing up despite geographic location. But I wonder if you were able to get at a finer scale, you would find that, you know, in this geographic region, it's this particular strain or species of Staphylococcus, and in this, it's and that kind of gets at interesting questions about function, you know, yes. and, and that's the big thing that people always say with the, with, with the ecological studies that are being done with sequencing. It's like, are you looking at taxonomic diversity? Are you looking at functional diversity? Which is, you know, should you look at both and then try to, <laughs> yeah, it's really, this is really interesting. Laura, did you see Noah Fear's tweet about kind of his cautions about looking at population data in microbial ecology? I did. I think I'll have to, I'll dig it out for you and send it to you. It's really funny. He has this whole about what to look out for, and, and, and it comes off kind of curmudgeonly. But he ends up saying, you know, these are things that, that he wishes he had done differently. And it talks about a lot of stuff, I think, that involves this. I will say what's interesting here is that they have a model system where you can culture the majority of organisms in it based on abundances. I mean, things that are present at more than 1%, they find representatives and note the language about it to your earlier idea. 
And it's fascinating to me that they can do this because then they can start putting things together and not, it, admittedly, kind of an artificial system in the 96 well plate with, um, what did they call it? They, they have their... Um, they're curds, they're, they're like, I, I'm calling it 1x curd media is what I'm calling it. But it's very much like that. But what else can you do? It's a place to start, and they're finding out interesting things. Um, but I, I, I really think that we, we uh, one of the things when you look at population stuff, especially low abundance stuff, is you worry, it is a contaminant? Did it come from my hands? So, you know, when I read the staff stuff, that's where I thought first. And, of course, that's almost certainly not the case based on abundances. Um, but that's what you have to start thinking about. It's the sequence data, and Laura can appreciate this, I think, best of all of us. It's like drinking from the fire hose. Yeah, that's true. So much stuff, and how do you know what's important and what's not? And that's the power of their approach. And um, I think, I, I think I do, that, well, I just wanted to build off what you said, and that I, I think that they, um, I think a key thing about this paper is that I think that's something that they recognize. Yeah. is that their question is not, what they're doing here is not trying to, it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of a goal than some of the papers we've, we've covered before. Yeah. Like, it, for instance, last month when we talked about the subway study, um, mm -hmm. where they're really relying on sequencing to try to tell them what is there. And in this case, what they're saying is, we're going to use our data to figure out what's dominant, and then we want that's not our ultimate goal. What we really want to do is be able to reproduce these communities in the lab so that we can start asking questions, just like Mark was saying, about do you inter what happens if you introduce something else? You know, what happens if you um, try to manipulate these different environmental conditions? Uh, what, are the, what are the relationships and the, and the interactions between different members of the community that seem to be most important for shaping the way it, the community is formed and the diversity and the composition. Um, so I, I like that that's where they're headed. So they don't really need to bash their heads against the sequencing wall too much. Right. And it's, it's interesting to me because when, I, when I'm teaching microbiology, at, at some point I want to talk a little bit about food microbiology, and I'll talk about the microbes involved with the Swiss versus cheddar flavor, two different pathways, two different organisms. And so that's where, you know, I'm sure people are going to come up with apologies to Jonathan Eisen ahead of time with the flavor room, because I'm almost promising you that's where we're going to go. Okay, and again, I'm not responsible, but I had to say it. Um, I also think that what's interesting here is the percentage of, of cultivable organisms. I've been a little concerned with things that don't grow in the laboratory, and I'm wondering if the reason there's such a high percentage of culturable things is the nutrient-rich environment. Yeah, isn't cheese pretty much already a culturing medium to start? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you look at if you look at um, in, in things from polluted environments, this is the Great Plating Anomaly idea. They tend to grow quite well, and it's not a surprise because what you're dealing with here is a very rich environment. And I'm wondering if that's what's involved here. And again, I think that would help those organisms. What What's the term that? Um, um, I can't remember his name right now. That's really embarrassing because he's uh, that that Tom Schmidt came up with copiotrophs, organisms that that live best at very high concentrations of nutrients, and I think that's what we're talking here. Certainly in this. Yeah. So for um, if that was the case, then wouldn't oh no, but it's um, I was just going to ask that if that was the case, then you might not see the same within the in vitro cheese versus the in situ cheese. But then um, the species, oh, but when they create the in vitro cheese, they inoculate it with the organisms of the in situ cheese. So then that that's not the case. So if because you're replicating the same environment from the in situ cheese with the same organisms, so then that it it essentially should be the same. I think I think you're right. Yeah, I think um, I think they were at this stage, from what I absorbed, they were trying to see if they could they could reconstruct those communities. Um, but it was interesting. Didn't they have one where they said they did four different types of reconstructions? We're kind of bouncing around here. This might be the punchline that we're getting to early. But uh, <laughs> but didn't they have four different communities that they um, yeah they did four different treatments. And I thought it was interesting that they found that one of the treatments was, gets back to the idea that it's this bloomy rind, 
where you heavily inoculate it with a fungus. And, and they found that the bloomy rind treatment did not diverge in composition from the control treatment where they didn't do anything to it. Um, so they didn't inoculate it with more fungus, they didn't do any of the washes or any of the other things. And, they, and I thought that was interesting because it, I, I couldn't tell from that if it meant that you know, maybe that particular fungal species or strain just didn't grab hold as the way it normally would. Maybe I don't know. That I thought that was interesting. So that that was um, kind of a way to look at if you tried to introduce a particularly dominant member, what would happen? Yeah. Incidentally, and I don't mean to bounce around still further, but one of the things I thought was was very wonderful is a video abstract. I don't know if you had a chance to watch that, and apart from, from the very famous Professor Dutton wearing a cheese hat, which she did do, I thought it was a really interesting way to go about things because there were lots of wonderful visuals. For example, the way the fungus interacted with some of the bacteria was remarkable. And you could see that they, it wasn't that they were killed, but they were certainly inhibited by it in one, in one image that they showed anyway. And I think that's a very good way to make this kind of work accessible to a wide variety of people. In, including folks like myself, who could be a little smarter. <laughs> That's true no, for all of us, I think. No, I, de I definitely agree with you, Mark. I really liked how they had the physical illustration of the two microbes, because sometimes that's something that you miss within a paper with, your, with the graphs, and um, you miss that physical illustration. What, is it that, what does it look like? What are you actually quantifying? And even with, um, with ours, like we pick the when we do fluorescence images, we pick the image that's most illustrative, but um, it's, it's always so much more helpful to have a picture. So, Laura, I actually had a question in terms of going back to the paper and understanding more about the techniques that were used compared to the New York subway paper. So I remember that in the New York subway paper, we mentioned certain shotgun genomics techniques were um, not sufficient to identify species. So I was wondering if you could comment um, in that, like, is it that you can still identify down to the genus, so that would be appropriate uh, using shotgun genomics, or what are the limitations of shotgun genomics in this technique? Sure. So what they did, um, they did two different techniques. So the first thing that they did, which is what generated the data for figure two, where they wanted to understand the diversity of these different cheese rind communities. So they went to this heroic cheese rind collecting effort, which I, I just envision as going around and eating a bunch of cheese and then going, maybe we should save it. But I don't think that's actually what I, I hear French music as they're walking around, don't you? Yeah, me too. Sounds they all really work great. great um, uh, but what, what they did was they wanted to do this sampling. So it was 137 different types of cheese across 10 countries. And the, what they did to understand the community composition was to sequence amplicons of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene for bacteria and the internal transcribed spacer for fungi. So these are characteristic kind of hallmark genes that are pretty well studied and pretty well organized for you to be able to say you know, if I have sequenced the V4 region of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene for bacteria, there is a large database that I can match it to so that I can identify it to the species level. So that's kind of the gold standard in terms of making taxonomic identifications. But because they were also interested in not only taxonomic diversity, they were also interested in functional diversity. So they were interested in trying to learn about which members of this community are doing which things to produce sulfur aroma or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they did shotgun metagenomics for that. So when you do shotgun metagenomics, you just have a huge pool of DNA. You don't amplify a specific gene. You sequence all of it, and then you try your best to try to figure out what your sequencing reads are telling you. I did look at the materials and methods to try to kind of understand what they did, but unfortunately I didn't have a lot of luck um, getting the details. I try. I didn't. I don't know if it's in the supplementary material. I looked through that and couldn't find any more methods. So maybe I just missed something because I don't know that cell can be a little frustrating to try to get through all the supplements. But 
I think it's very likely that I think it's very likely that they're running into some of the same difficulties as anyone would with short read sequencing. So um, you can try to make some identifications of functions, so genes that might be serving a particular function. Uh, they did say that they mapped some reads to a reference genome, which is kind of what we talked about with the subway study before. And that right. tells them a little bit more. Uh, because if they can get mapping to that genome, they can say, oh, we've probably got this particular strain that's doing this function. I was um, pretty happy with them using MGL, um, methionine gamma ligase, because that's, it's, and, and they're showing things related to other known cheese, ma cheese well, not cheese making, what would I say, cheese associated strains. Um, and and I, I, I like that, I, and, and, and I think they're really onto it here. Um, but <laughs> How, how do you, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff to go through, as you say. Yeah, and my guess is if they really wanted to, if they really wanted to start thinking about functional diversity, um, probably what they would do is, is since you can culture many of these, these microbial members fairly readily, probably what they might do is start culturing them, looking for diversity, and just sequencing full genomes. Yeah. Uh, because that, that tells you in pretty convincing detail, like this is the full genome of this dominant member of this community, and when we annotate it, it has these pathways and probably does these things. Um, they they might be doing that now. I don't know. So if you if you sequence the full genome, then that means that you would end up limit. You would then be down from instead of the genus down to the species, you would be identifying specific species that are involved. Is that correct? Right. If you get a full genome for a bacterial isolate from one of these communities, you can you then have the entire content of its chromosome. So you could say its genus, its species. If there's enough information about other genomes, you might even be able to differentiate it based on strain. So you could say compared to other whatever species it is that are that are available in the gene in the genome it doesn't have these genes to do this pathway but it has these other genes that this one doesn't so you can start to characterize strain specific differences which could be a scale at which it, i mean it's i don't i don't honestly know if strain level differences are a scale at which has a, a big impact on cheese production it could but it's certainly a question that's open about what shapes microbial community composition, do you find that there are strains within dominant genera and species that end up being more or less adapted in specific circumstances? I think that's an interesting question. So then using the approach that they did, it's very good to get a broad overview of everything that's present. But then, um, if you did, if you were able to get down to the species specifications, you would be able to compare functionally um, which you would. It's kind of like looking. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to look for an analogy for this, where you have something that um, you look at just at greater and greater magnification. So if you start out at using a magnifying glass looking at the same sample versus then looking at it using a, a microscope at 60 times or 100 times magnification, then looking at the same thing with um, at it in an electron microscope. So then you would just get greater and greater detail as you go down and then be able to um, analyze functional comparisons. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think, I think using resolution as an analogy is, is a good one. Um, and I, But I think the I think the open question is, um, is that is that what are the key factors that are that lead to community composition that lead to when we end up with kind of I don't know if you call it a mature microbial community because they 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 have any kind of environmental disturbance that'll change them, but if you have an established microbial community, how does it get established, and is it that for certain cheese rinds any Staphylococcus that's present becomes your your dominant your dominant member because there's something common to Staphylococcus, or is it that there is a particular subset of Staphylococcus that has an, a certain function that not all Staphylococcus has that then leads to the to the to the establishment of a particular community? 
Well, I mean, staph, staph is, is fairly resistant to salt. I mean, that's one of the standard ways to get them off your skin. Um, and, and I mean, we're, there are issues of pH involved, too. So it's a really fascinating study. I mean, later on, and I know you're going here, Laura, there's this whole business with the fungi versus pH in the rind. Um, and so whether the organisms are interacting or whether they're changing the environment. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Form of interaction, yeah. Before we, uh, before we bounce to that, oh, sorry, Karen, I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, I, no, no, that's okay. Um, I was just going to switch to talking about the abiotic factors, but you can go ahead. No, that's actually, that's what I was going to bring up, too. So, hooray. Because um, we started talking about moisture, and we, we kind of talked about some of the abiotic factors that, that shapes the microbial community composition. And I just wanted to, before, before we got too far away from it, um, when I was reading this paper, I have like I was looking at Figure Two, which lists the dominant um, bacterial genera in the cheese rinds, and I have this little mark next to Psychobacter, because I was like, oh, Psychobacter, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so there are, you know, so there's there's cold tolerant bacteria growing in some of these cheese rinds as a dominant member of the community, which I did not I did not know that um, that that was kind of that was something that perhaps during the aging process, because it's often cheese is stored in a, in a cooler area to, to age. Um, that's really interesting. And then there was another one with the salt, and I can't find my note about that now, but there was a, they made a point about, where did it go? They made a point about salt and how sea salt might be introducing particular bacteria into the cheese. And I can't find it, but I don't know if you guys remember seeing it. Oh, here it is. Marine microbes. So they found some halo-tolerant gamma proteobacteria that were dominant genera. So Vibrio, Halomonas, Pseudo-Alteromonas. Um, and they said they have some hypotheses about how that might have happened. So they said one possible source of these marine microbes is the sea salt used in cheese production as marine gamma proteobacteria have been detected both in brine tanks of cheese production facilities and in sea salt producing areas in Korea. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I really liked that. <laughs> well, it was interesting because they were talking about polar pseudoalteromonas, and I, I can go take a couple of mils of seawater here from Puget Sound and find that bad boy. That's not a hard one to find at all. I think where they're trying to go is the idea of how important site... Um, how important it is, and I can't do the, the, the variation of this term, how psychrophilic the associations need to be because of the low temperature at which they're, they're actually incubating the cheese. And I think that might in, be important, absolutely. I mean, when you say 15 degrees C, it sounds all chilly, but, you know, if you swim around here, you know, it gets pretty cool. Not that I mean to tell you that. How much snow do you have right now? Well, it's almost gone. Yeah. <laughs> Till next week. Yeah, yeah. So I guess then we, we started talking about the abiotic factors. Well, one, um, I was actually just really surprised to know that microbes still survive in preserved salt. So dried salt, I didn't, dried sea salt, I didn't realize still contained microbes, which yeah. means we are probably eating them. <laughs> you are. And, 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 and you'll often see organisms like that. Uh, you'll, you'll see some of the halophilic archaeans. In, in, in intestinal contents, and that's what's thought to, to be the source of it. But it's a pretty standard lab exercise to isolate halophiles from, you know, designer salt, which is pretty interesting. doesn't always work as well as you would hope, but it, it does work. Oh, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. All right. So then we talked about um, the salt content, and then they also mentioned about moisture and pH. And so what I... What I found really unique was that, um, maybe I'm also jumping ahead and jumping around here, was that the pH actually influenced the interactions between the different bacteria and fungi. And so, like, I was wondering if that's because of, like, it probably has to do with both growth, but then also of, yeah, no, actually it just has to do with growth. Would you, <laughs> would you agree with that, Mark? I think that's what I got out of it, except for King Arthrobacter, which apparently inhibits lots of other things. That's the one that actually inhibited fungi, as opposed to the other way. Oh, the the Arthrobacter one 
Oh yes, the the one where they had at the bottom of six E. Is that is that the one that you were talking yes. about? Yes. Yes. Do you think that it's likely that it could have some sort of um, antifungal in that it's secreting? I, I almost certainly. It doesn't seem to appear to affect the the bacteria nearby. Um, I, I'm kind of fond of Arthrobacter. It's got that whole kind of clicky way of dividing, right? Which is kind of cool. Which is the which is the see I can't remember, but which is the bacterium that forms the that's the nematode trapping bacterium, or that's a, that's a fungus, isn't it? That's a fungus. That's a fungus. Bot yeah. Arthrobacter or something like that. That's right. There are two types. There's the one that like fires a spore into the nematode, and the other that makes the lasso. Yes, that's, that's what, what I'm thinking of. Okay. Right. Not at all related to cheese, sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. I think, that, I think the conclusion of this conversation is that I obviously have not had the, a breadth of knowledge in terms of the different very bacterial species out there, and I need to brush up. <laughs> well, that was a fungus that I misremembered as a bacterium, so I need to brush up too. <laughs> but Karen, Karen, studying this is not only interesting but delicious as well. No, definitely, and I, I, tot I totally agree with that. But um, when I was reading this, um, what interested me was uh, I was thinking about your um, the interactions that were predatory, like other than they're saying that you have positive and negative interactions, but what about um, predatory interactions between the fungus and the bacteria? So I was wondering if you both could comment to that, and how would you be able, to, would you be able to tell if predatory interactions were occurring from this data? Hmm. I think, I mean, Mark, you, you, I have not gotten my hands on the, the paper. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, not going to remember now, but there's, there's some discussion about how would you actually define something as being predation. I have the PDF of, of the great Mortimer Stars paper. I do warn you, you will never get the 1.5 hours back that you spend, okay, reading it. Never, ever. Uh, but to answer your answer your question, Karen, I think that we're used to very large effects. And if you think about, say, the dairy industry, and they'll often get phage attacks in the dairy industry, they'll completely destroy what they're doing. You know, it'll kill all the bacteria there. When I used to work in um, the biotech industry, we would grow up huge culture vessels of Xanthomonas campestris, isolate xanthan gum, and we would get phage in there, and would turn everything into froth. So we're used to those large-scale things, but what I'm wondering, and this is absolutely true with bacterial predators such as Della Vibrio and the Balo types, is they're at low numbers. They reach this very low steady state. Just like if you go searching through Africa, you don't see lions everywhere. You see a lot more antelope. So um, you'd have to figure out how you would measure it, per se. And I, I, I think as they begin combining... Um, members, let's just say for the sake of argument they had some sort of predator that they isolated. They would see that in their in vitro system very quickly. In and that I, it would like, destroy what else was there. And I think there's a there there is a distinction to be made between an organism whose whose lifestyle is to actively attack and predate upon other organisms as a means of acquiring nutrients and sustaining itself and organisms that are basically waging warfare on their on their space or nutrient competitors. And I think that's there's a lot of, of microbes that have strategies for trying to say, get off my lawn, basically. Yeah, but um, they're not older microbes. <laughs> there you go. So based on, on the data that they show here, the environment is relatively stable and you don't have these massive changes being shown by um, predation. So then, but then it's also possible that within that 1% of uh, low, of uncharacterized rare taxa that there might be predatory bacteria in there. Is that what you, may, is that what you mean, Mark? Sure, sure. Um, and, and it, you know, it depends how, I mean, how Catholic the taste of the predator is. If, if they're very specific in the organism that they consume, you might not ever see it unless you gave it the right prey. If they're more general, then you might see it. I, I tend to, to and there's this whole panoply of different predation lifestyles, for lack of a better term. And the ones that are more general, the ones that say secrete hydrolytic enzymes, the wolf pack idea, 
those tend to affect a lot of different things. But the, the more one-on-one -on -one specific is different. And it'll be very interesting. I have had lots of friends tell me, for example, that they have seen Della Vibrio in very odd places. And I'll say, well, do you have an EM? Do you have some kind of platforming thing? And they'll say, no, we saw it at 16S. And I am, to say I'm nervous about that is, is not sufficient to, to explain my sentiment on it. I mean, you want to be able to see them in action, and it's not easy to do. Okay. But I, I would not be at all surprised to see antagonistic, well, in fact, you do see antagonistic um, associations. And it's interesting that they, they make a comment here that in some ways, fungi that we think of as making all these antimicrobials may well just be changing the pH, thereby excluding other things. And this is very similar to what you see in the secession that takes place ecologically in sauerkraut. You have different classes of organisms, and they alter the environment to allow the next guild to do well. And there might, there might be something very similar to that going on here. Well, and that's, um, that's the strategy. It's not antagonistic against something else, but that's the survival strategy for Helicobacter, right? That it has yeah. urease that, that um, locally creates a, a buffered area to protect itself from the stomach acid. They make their own buffer. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting point about pH. I don't know that that, it's one of those things that, I mean, how early do you learn that in chemistry? And then, you know, we yeah. might have, we, it might be something that is that fundamental to the environment that is dictating some of these relationships. That's really interesting. It's in my head because I've worked with a lot of marine vibrios, and many of them tend to secrete acids, lactic and pyruvic acid. And, I, and they do it, I think, to offset the slightly alkaline nature of seawater. And so if you, for example, leave them on a plate for a long time, they commit suicide. You can't recover them. And it's because of the amount of acid they produce. If you buffer it, they live a lot, a lot longer. And it's very interesting to think about. And just as that's something that's kind of pesky to me, um, this is actually an advantage to cheese making. It's fascinating. By the way, did you notice in the, um, in, in the references there's someone working on the fungal side of it whose last name is Cheeseman? Is that true? Because in the table of contents for this issue, there was a paper by somebody named Cheese Man, and I thought, I sense a broad conspiracy about cheese in this issue. No, I'm, I'm quite sure that that person <laughs> upon birth it had no more choice in their career path. Right there. Exactly. That's well, great. Maybe his ancestors made cheese. And, you know, <laughs> if you just instead of being a cheese maker, you just diverge from that, and you end up studying cheese instead. There you go. Um, so, I... I remember that the, the two of you wanted uh, had certain questions and things that you wanted to bring up about uh, microbial communities. What are those things that you noticed and found that you were unique um, within the data? Laura? Oh, sorry. I, I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was going to me first. Um, you know, this made me kind of think about I mean, we've touched on this already because we were talking about predatory interactions. But one of one of the, as I'm going through the literature, since this is a new system that I'm that I'm now really able to devote my time to, um, I've been going through the literature, and I think it's as Mark was saying, it's an interesting open question about how much do predatory bacteria shape microbial community composition out in the wild, if you will. Um, and there are lots of questions like that that are very challenging to address. Um, it did make me wonder with this cheese, I mean, so getting, as we talked about to start with, getting model systems, getting tractable experimental systems up and running so that you can say, I have this fundamental question, you know, and the same way that people say, what does this protein do? Let's turn to E. coli, for better or worse. You know, you could say, I have this question about how interactions between these particular species of bacteria, um, you know, how does this work in cheese? You could start thinking about things like experimental evolution. So how many, how, you know, you've got your cheese communities and your cheese, cheese rinds, and you could, since you can do, like, starters, like, I don't know, there, how much could you go out generations of cheese communities to see what changes? And I know there are people... Um, like Matreya Dunham, who's looking at beer, for instance, in terms of thinking about food production and, and beverage production, how microbes play roles in that. So, yeah, I, I, this is really, yeah, this is really interesting to me because it gives some idea of 
how can you bring big microbial ecology questions into the lab and try to start teasing them apart? I, I mean, uh, I got interested in kefir a number of years ago because it's possible to take the standard kefir that you use with milk, and it's got a relatively small number of constituents. You can't grow them all, though. That's the interesting part. Lynn Margulis has a wonderful paper about whether you should think of those grains in kefir as being organisms, for example. Um, but when you cultivate it on grape juice instead of milk, and it takes several cycles, the grains change shape, and I'm sure they, they change their constituents. And that got me thinking about what enters and leaves in association. And, and I want to, I made a mistake earlier when I mentioned that uh, my colleague Ashley Shade was looking at kefir. In fact, she was looking at kombucha, which is, is even more disturbing, right? Because kefir, most people are happy with. Kombucha is fabulous, okay? Um, and well worth your time. And again, looking for some kind of model system. And what's interesting to me about this is that in both kombucha and kefir, I don't think you can grow all the constituents. But in this cheese example, it looks like you can. And as you kind of dissect out the membership, you can add and remove what's there and find out all kinds of things. I am interested in the interactions between organisms, though. I'm sorry, Laura. Oh no, I was I was I was uh, rudely interrupting you to say, oh, you could um, you could you could. I was just thinking you could if you had a isolate that you was a dominant member and you wanted to understand if a particular pathway was important for either the community, the ultimate cheese product, or the interactions. You could start doing some knockouts and then you could put it back in and see now what happens. And there you go. And 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 watch the artisan cheese makers start carry signs anti-GMO, right? Right. We have to change the name to, you know, we have to make it kind of funnier involving cheese. But I think this is a fabulous paper. I think there's so many interesting things that are part of it. I love the system in which they have 96 well plates with this cheese-like media that they grow things in. Cheese um, curd auger. Cheese curd auger, yes. And I, I find that fascinating. I, I like how they were very careful about how they were looking at um, their OTU assignments. Uh, because, again, it's it's really for, for old school people like me where you're used to looking at the entire length of the 16S and then here you are looking at, like, 200 bases. You get worried. I've had lots of people who've done the old style stuff who say, why why don't you go any finer than, than genus? Well, because of exactly that. And I really think it was an interesting paper to go through. Well, there are a number of things that you mentioned in there that um, I have... A lot that I can comment on, uh, Mark. What, one is um, when you mentioned about kombucha. Um, my friend works on a Japanese organic farm, and she had a culture of kombucha. And she was like, oh, there's this new drink um, that I made that gives me more energy. And she was like, oh, would you like to try some? And so she opens this canister, and it's got this gigantic microbial mat that's about this big yep. um, within the canister. And it was it was amazing. I was like, what? How did that even happen? <laughs> and you're still you're able to drink that. I was scared, but it was still edible. Well, it's interesting. I mean, when you look on the internet and they show the kombucha, uh, and it's not a mushroom. It, as you say, it's a microbial mat. Um, and and you see these like thin pancake like. It's not how it looks. It really isn't. They take the stuff from underneath it, and I think it's a fabulous thing to start studying. I, the, the study of fermented foods is fascinating, and there's so much cool stuff about it. But to get back to cheese, I was, if I miss this, Laura and Karen, you have to let me know. Did they look at my favorite bizarre cheese, Kazu Marzu? I did not see it. No, I, I did not see, see that listed. Do you know what that is? I do not. I just sent you a link, Laura. It is the maggot cheese. Yes, and what I sent you was a Gordon, because I don't like Gordon Ramsay. He actually gets to try some. His reaction is priceless. I'll have to watch that. I'm also glad that it's almost three here instead of lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's fascinating to read read about. And you wonder, if you have these little flies that, that lay their eggs, and they're used, they, it's all in Sardinia. It's a cultural kind of cheese thing. It's fascinating to read about. You wonder... So are they just bringing random environmental things, rather the way that we make vinegar and just opening it out to the environment, right? Uh, or are there specific co-evolved populations? And we already know from studying fermentation that some fruit flies are able to specifically pick up particular species of yeast. It would not at all surprise me 
that the Kazu Marzu fly was actually specifically moving particular microbial populations. But I admit I like gross stuff. Sorry. So then no, it's, I wouldn't it's, an, it. <laughs> it's an ecology of both the the fly and the yes. microbes within the cheese. Yes. Which is that, that actually in that in itself, that's really cool because it's an entire ecosystem which is not just microbe, but it's like cross species even into the insect factor, which is really cool. Yes. I can't I believe like it. Seth is not here to tell us whether or not where this falls on the hologenome idea. <laughs> I was just thinking that. I was thinking Seth, Seth should be here so he so Seth Bordenstein can tell us where he thinks this this sits in that. I, you know, I mean that's that's interesting when you start to think about these interdependencies. I mean, to the fly, the fly probably unless there unless it needs a certain environment to hatch it, you know, to continue its life cycle. Um, that's really interesting. No, when, when they make the they make the pre cheese, as it were, they just leave it open in a shack, is what they do, and you see all the flies. I don't mean to be gross with you, uh, but it's really fascinating, and you see them wriggling around in there. Is that the only? I mean, I'm surely that that's not the only place that the fly. I mean, it's ideal for the fly, but the fly can can lay eggs and continue elsewhere. I, right? I don't even know. This is. Okay. This such a fascinating idea. Laura, I've got your sabbatical for you right there. <laughs> How do you feel about going to Sardinia? Maggot cheese. Yes. Read yeah. about it. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> but again, yeah. without sounding flippant, this all comes down to the populations. We're, we're surrounded by clouds of microbes at all times, and we know how plastic and changeable microbial genomes are. So it's not a surprise they would specifically adapt to given environments, to be carried by a vector of something. Maybe we're the vector, right? Um, all kinds of things like that are very fascinating. And uh, that's what I really enjoy about this paper. The Dutton group needs like serious kudos and applause, as well as a wine and cheese party, yes. Um, but this is fascinating stuff to think about. And, 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 and I love the idea of how they can dissect out the members and put them back again. Do not be at all surprised that Harvard gets some money for the flavor ohm. That would not surprise me in the slightest. And I, I totally agree that if you can make good tasting cheese by just identifying specific microbes and putting them in different combinations, I would love to do that. <laughs> I think that would be such a fantastic idea. Yeah, yeah. And um, with that, uh, we are almost at 12 o'clock, so um, are, do we have any final comments? Um, uh, like we, I think the, in general we have all really, really enjoyed the paper and the implications that the paper has for microbial ecology and the benefit that um, I was just thinking that it's beneficial that it's in a solid rather than in a liquid because within a solid community um, it, you can have more stable interactions or, or be able to detect more stable interactions rather than within a liquid because liquid would be vastly more um, complex to characterize and they move around much faster and so yeah. the the fact that it's a solid is definitely an added benefit. And I am fascinated by the strategography or whatever the word I would use. Um, as you go through from the outside rind to the inner, you know, those populations are going to be real different from one another and it's going to be fascinating to look at. There's a world in a wheel of cheese. That's so with our, that, that oh, I was sorry. just about to say, you have to end with that because that's a great tag quote. <laughs> so it's a world, so that's going to be the tagline. Um, it's a world within a wheel of cheese. Okay, and with that, um, thank you for joining us for our uh, Google Plus Microbiology uh, Journal Club. We hope you enjoyed it, and definitely please join us next time. Yes. And there's something that Laura and I would like to share with everyone, and that is if you favor our tweets, we're going to invite you. Please, <laughs> when you favor our tweets, we think that you're interested. So we will invite you, and we really do want to open this up to everybody to come, including um, graduate students, postdocs, and uh, faculty, anybody who's interested in science. We're an incredibly diverse group, so it doesn't matter if this is your field or if not, it's not particularly your area of interest, but definitely I think that the amount of knowledge that you get from understanding and discussing 
broad questions of microbiology can apply to incredibly specific areas within your field of interest. And I've gotten a lot of knowledge just by learning and understanding different systems and saying, okay, this, uh, what we found here, probably can also adapt here. So um, it's important to learn uh, broad things within microbiology so that you can understand yours as well. And so with that, um, thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Bye. Bye.